Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast. A podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, in today's conversation, we have something a little bit different. Um, As part of a presentation I did recently with the Australian Institute of Business Brokers, I covered some absolutely critical tips for any advisors working with business owners when they are buying or selling a business. The question that was asked was when you are putting together a heads of agreement, what are the risks for you as a business broker? The answer was probably a lot longer than expected. But as you're about to hear, we covered a lot of ground explaining that the devil is in the detail when it comes to contracts and what creates binding relationships in them and risk for you if you're an advisor. This episode covers what actually constitutes the formation of a contract before it gets to a lawyer, what creates a binding relationship, where the risks lie for you if you are an advisor to a business, and some of the traps I've seen advisors fall into when putting together an offer. So employee entitlements, for example, are just one of them. And lastly, I cover in this episode what you can do to avoid taking on unnecessary risk, but that still gets enough detail across to the deal team in a way that avoids slowing down a deal. Now, all of these are really important to keep in mind. So without further ado, here we go on my take on where the risks are. The relevance of what is a contract, how do you form a contract, it's not so relevant for for the um, sale contract that we're dealing with, the the business sale agreement, because that's usually dealt with by solicitors and it's quite a formal agreement and, you know, as to whether there's a binding contract is pretty obvious. Usually there's not an issue with that. Where I think it's particularly relevant to understand the things that contribute to a contract, things that, that maybe create issues with the creation of the contract. And when we're talking about create a contract, what we're actually talking about here is creating enforceability. So creating something that is enforceable by one party against another is the documents that you deal with that might be outside of when the time in which lawyers are engaged. So that can be heads of agreement, your letter of understanding, your MOR, uh, memorandum of understanding, letter of intent, whatever you're calling it. This, I mean, one, one of the fabulous things I think in this world is the number of different names you can give the one document. And people often say to me, okay, what's the fundamental difference between a memorandum of understanding and a letter of intent or an NBIO, non-binding indicative offer, or a commercial terms document. There is no relevance of the title. All this is is uh, we where we're seeking to set out the, the high-level commercial terms before the parties before either of them go and commit expense to getting further into the deal. That's the idea of these sort of high-level documents. And the only question is the extent to which any of them are enforceable. So the name of the document, what you call it, doesn't matter. It has no uh, impact. What is important is whether and the extent to which any component of it would seem would be seen to be enforceable. And so this is where you've got to be careful because quite often you're at the cutting edge of crafting these documents and you just have to, if that's what you're doing, you just have to be clear that you're, um, that you're crafting it in a way where you're not accidentally making it enforceable if you didn't intend to or not making it enforceable if you did intend to. Now, there's generally what happens is in this offer stage, the only bits that we want to make enforceable are usually two provisions. One is confidentiality, but you should always have a separate NDA or confidentiality agreement in any event to protect the seller's um, information, confidential information, before passing it over to the buyer. 
uh, or prospective buyers, um, and the exclusivity. So quite often a buyer will want an, a period of exclusivity, and this depends on transaction size. Um, but once we hit a particular transaction size, it will almost always be the case that the buyer wants a period of exclusivity um, while they're committing funds to go and um, do their DD and while you're negotiating the sale contract. So where that's the case, you just have to be careful that what you're, what you're drafting doesn't create a binding relationship if that's not intended or, or doesn't achieve a binding relationship if that is what it is intended. So, um, so if you're using an NDA, make sure you're using an NDA that works properly. So that's because that's an example of something that you want binding. You want it to be binding in nature. Um, and if you're creating, I, I see um, so many different versions of these heads of agreement or, or um, you know, commercial term sheets or, or whatever you call them in your own world. One of the issues that I do see from time to time is too much detail. The amount of deal that you put in this heads of agreement, um, it can be a direct reflection on the risk that you're taking on board yourself. Um, because let, let's say for an example, the area of employee entitlements. Now, employee entitlements, this area is fraught. Um, and I've got to say, um, you know, I spend a lot of time tra training our team on it, these people who understand the law. Um, I think as a whole industry-wide, perhaps it's even more confusing than anyone really even anticipates. I've just finished a client information sheet that we use to send out to our clients that is eight pages explaining the high level things for them to be aware of. And I've just finished an internal guidance note um, for all of our team who work on these deals. That is 26 pages and that doesn't even include all of it. So that's an internal guidance note. So that just gives you an idea of the amount of complexity that is sitting behind employee entitlements. So what you don't want to do is um, what I have seen happen in the past. You don't want to in your heads agreement, commercial terms, whatever you're calling it, set out a, a full clause about whether or not the buyer uh, buyer will recognise service, whether or not, you know, and how those things will be dealt with because you are probably weighing into an area that you probably don't fully understand the consequences of on both sides. So don't put that sort of detail into the heads of agreement. That's something that the lawyers are paid to take the risk of in terms of explanation to their clients. Um, so that's something, that's an example of an area where I see people, brokers put detailing that doesn't need to be there. Well, here, I'll, I'll give you an example of the complexity of this, um, the personal leave side. Um, we've, we, if we talk about the three different state-based contracts, so New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, which is where sort of um, the, the volume of uh, business sale activity happens. But if we just talk about um, Vict the, the standard form contracts that come out in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, we have three different approaches to personal leave and how personal leave is calculated there. So Victoria has a standard position of a calculation of 35% adjustment for personal leave. New South Wales has a ticker box exercise. You can apply adjustment um, at which point it will be a 70% adjustment, 70% Adjustment is on the basis of a tax discount, not a contingency discount, um, if that makes sense. I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but it only applies if there's a ticker box. So if the box isn't ticked, there the personal leave liability will probably pass to the buyer, but there is no adjustment that is made if the box isn't ticked. And Queensland, the REIQ contract just has uh, doesn't distinguish personal leave. It's dealt with in the same as all other leave. The problem is that personal leave is a contingent liability, not an actual li liability. And that's why we have this tic-tacking between the buyer and seller um, sometimes if they understand um, the, the issues that that are involved. And so I quite like the Victorian approach, but just the, the mere fact, and here's, here's a funny thing, REIQ calls it sick leave. Now, we haven't called this sick leave for, I reckon, 20 years or so. like that. So it's still adopting the terminology that we used 
before the personal leave concept came in. So like this is this is an example of how the it's it's such a complex issue that it is different state to state. It's not different legislatively state to state. It's just different in how the state-based contracts are prepared. So that just gives you an idea of how complex the issue is because these people who've created the state-based contracts haven't even got on the same level as to how to deal with all of this. If there's an agreement in relation to personal leave 7030, in fact, there would always be a 7030 split anyway, or 70, 70, 75, 25. The, the 70% adjustment is on the basis of a tax deduction. Uh, does that make sense? It's not a deduction on the basis of a con the fact that personal leave is a contingent, not an actual liability. So that means if if you're out there negotiating with a buyer and seller to 70%, that, that is in fact what it would be anyway. So that's not a contingent um, a adjustment. A contingent adjustment might be the 50-50, but we look at the, the way um, I actually do it is I look at the value of the employee entitlements and the length of service and, and then sometimes even sort of that how the usage um, sort of sits and then we work out some approach around there. So it it I I generally opt more to 25% or 35%, but that's if I'm sell side. If we buy side, of course, we might want more protection, but then there's other ways that we can get to that. It doesn't necessarily just have to be on the basis of the adjustment. But the point is, if you're out there negotiating, boy, that's a lot of stuff you have to have in your mind to, to I'd be, I'd just be very careful. And it doesn't, I think there's there's no I, I think it's it's very and you won't the, the problem is you won't necessarily end up with a lawyer on the deal who fully understands what's going on in this area anyway right and we all know we don't want this sort of stuff to um, slow it, the deals down and create issues so I completely understand you want to get in there on the front foot and try and help to negotiate something that seems to work for both sides but just be aware that there's a whole heap of risk there if it's not properly explained to either party and so I would suggest by all means go negotiate make sure you do it with a really big disclaimer of but I'm not a lawyer I can't tell you the the ramifications in terms of the employee um, the obligations that you have um, and employee entitlements as a whole I would say it from that perspective and then in the if you want to put something in the heads of agreement you could say the parties have um, agreed that they may want to split it, something like this. So, so don't use absolutes and don't don't create the environment where it looks like you've advised a certain. I mean, by all means, try and negotiate it, but just give yourself lots of buffer so no one's holding you to account if you haven't explained what may happen when the buyer realises the actual liability they've taken over or the seller realises there could have been a different way or that there was also something sitting in long service leave that they hadn't contemplated or all of those sorts of things. And just give yourself protection is the answer. Well, that's it for this episode of the Deal Room podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you've got any other questions after listening through this or if you've got a buyer or seller who is ready for contracting who needs help with this stage of their deal, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Check out the details in the show notes or contact me at joanna.oki at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.